Hi, my name is Emily Newman with Ready and Newman PC, coming to you live from Houston, Texas. Uh, I'm an immigration attorney, and our office has been practicing immigration law back since 1997, and we come here every Tuesday to talk to you live about the latest updates in immigration and answer your questions live. Also today with me is Rebecca Chen. She's one of the senior attorneys with our office. Hello. So she'll be also here to answer your questions and has a lot of insight about all the latest trends in immigration adjudications when it comes to employment-based immigration. Um, so just a few quick updates for you. We talk a lot each week about the process of the CAP cases that were filed in the lottery. Um, I get you know emails and questions every day asking why is it taking so long? You know, are other people still waiting? How come no action's been taken on my case? That is totally normal, unfortunately, sad to say. Yeah. Um, but things are taking a long time, and we have still about 15% of our cases have not been touched at all by USCIS. Uh, they're all pending with the California Service Center. It's just a slow process. Um, we're still getting requests for evidence, uh, but it is slow, and we are still getting approvals as well but definitely slow processing this year yeah so we we're getting some RFEs some approvals but they're just really kind of trickling in whereas over the summer they seem to be coming in by the dozens um, so by this point I would say it's still pretty normal if you haven't seen any movement on your case no RFE no decision um, so just keep calm for now and keep waiting um, we know it's difficult especially for the cap gap applicants um, but yeah, once there is any movement on the case, um, hopefully your attorney will let you know as soon as possible. So is there anything that the employee can do to speed up the processing or contact USCIS or find out any information? Not right now, unfortunately. Um, the processing time website for USCIS, uh, they have a pretty improved processing time website that came up this year where you can search by the application type and the service center to see exactly how long it's taking um, for quota applications H-1Bs filed at the Vermont Service Center or California Service Center they are pretty much stuck right now um, pre-April of this year so unfortunately you can't even really put in uh, a case status inquiry for your application if it's still pending. If you do, you'll just be told that it's still within normal processing time. That's their normal response. Um, and of course, since premium processing is still suspended right now, um, unfortunately, there's not much that can be done. I would say for cap gap applicants, we have been encouraging uh, people in this uh, scenario especially to maybe try contacting your uh, local congressperson, your representative, um, make them aware of the situation um, because for cap gap applicants obviously after September 30th they no longer have work authorization so it's um, even more kind of, of a dire situation for you so unfortunately beyond that there's not that much we can do right now. Yeah for employers um, it might be time to take these things to court. Uh, we are seeing a lot more uh, litigation on employment-based immigration cases and one way that employers can speed up the processing of these petitions that seem to be taking forever is a mandamus action which is basically a lawsuit that the employer files in order to compel the immigration service to adjudicate the case and actually finish the process. Now the, the lawsuit isn't to um, you know, determine what the outcome will be. They just want some action to be taken. Uh, so that might be the new method of getting yeah. things done, unfortunately, right now. So that mm -hmm. is something that employers should be considering if you really need someone uh, to get their approval and you're tired of waiting, um, file a lawsuit might be your next step. Mm -hmm. So, uh, there are always new developments in immigration law this year. Um, it seems like every week there's something new. So this week, um, actually related to the lottery process for next year possibly, uh, there was an article on Bloomberg uh, which featured an interview with the USCIS director, Francis Cisna. Um, the title of the article, Skilled Visa Process Could Look a Lot Different Next Year. So um, what does Director Cisna suggest in that interview? So we knew from the uh, regulatory agenda that came out last December, I believe, 
that one of the things USCIS and Homeland Security was looking to regulate um, soon would be the lottery process as well as the definition of specialty occupation, employer-employee relationship. Uh, they know, we know that they wanted to make changes to the H-4 EAD regulation. So those were all announced in the regulatory agenda and specifically for the lottery process According to this interview in this article, it sounds like the regulation for changing how the lottery is done, they're planning on implementing it in time for April 2019. That's very surprising to me yeah. because that's less than six months away, and it seems very unlikely to me that they'll be able to get through the whole regulatory process in less than six months when, as of today, they haven't even submitted a proposal to OMB for their initial review. Right. So um, there wasn't really any more information in the article or you know, description of how exactly they intend to get this in place by April 2019, but that does seem to be what the plan is. Um, you know, it's possible that they may be able to fast track this proposal on the basis that they've proposed it before. So we've mm -hmm. talked before uh, about how in 2011 there was a proposed regulation to create this pre-registration process for the lottery. And um, you know they, they published it in the Federal Register, they took the comments, and then they never finalized the rule. So possibly maybe based on the comments they got on that rule, they're going to issue directly a final rule or an interim final rule. That seems mm -hmm. to be the only way that they could get it done yeah. uh, in that time. So just to kind of give you an idea of what they were planning on doing in 2011, and I believe the interview from uh, Director Cisna does say that they're planning something similar, mm -hmm. or it'll be along those lines. So I went back to that old proposed regulation. Um, basically what they're wanting to do, and again, this is not a valid proposal right now, but it's something that we might see uh, in time for the April 2019 lottery. So what they want to do is open up an online portal or website in the month of March and allow employers a two-week window to register their employees that they plan to sponsor in the H-1B lottery. Once they receive all of those registrations, the lottery will be conducted based solely on all of those registrations. Um, so once they do that, they're going to select the certain number of petitions or certain number of registrations and then send out notifications saying, you've been selected, now file your petition. Mm -hmm. So they'll give you 60 days to submit your petition um, and then they'll go through the regular adjudic adjudication process. So what do employers have to submit in order to register? It's very basic. Uh, they, uh, this is again based on what they had proposed in 2011. They were just wanting the employer name, the tax ID number, the company address, the uh, contact information of the signatory or a representative of the company. For the employee, they just want their name, date of birth, country of birth, country of citizenship, gender, and passport number. That's it. So they're really just wanting to use that information to figure out, to make sure there's no duplicates filed by the same company. Right. Um, and they said that in the event that someone accidentally submits someone twice, they'll accept the first one and then reject the second one. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't say anything about how they'll determine whether it's master's or bachelor's cap, which yeah. I thought was interesting. Maybe that is coming, uh, or maybe they didn't think about that at that time. I, you know, because it's going to be a relatively simple registration process, I'm worried that it's really going to increase the number of people registering um, yeah. because you don't have to prove that you have a job. Right. You can just, you know, if you maybe only have room for actually five H-1B workers, maybe you'll register ten people yeah. in the hopes that five will get selected and you'll be able to file and then you can later figure out your documentation. That makes me a little nervous mm -hmm. um, that we'll have so many registrations that the number of people, you know, the chances of getting selected are going to be even lower when they were actually getting better mm -hmm. uh, in the last couple of years. So stay tuned for that. Again, there's no proposal right now. 
Um, there's nothing in the OMB for review on that. This is just based on an interview that was uh, in a Bloomberg article that uh, indicates Director Cisna is planning on implementing this in time for April 2019. Yeah, so that would definitely uh, be a huge change from the way the lottery has been conducted for years I and mean, decades, basically. Um, and it would be pretty last minute by, you know, by current standards to implement something like that by April. So we'll have to see how that goes. Uh, USCIS has also announced a policy change this week, I believe, concerning medical exams for I-485 applications. Um, so what have they announced differently regarding that? So yeah, this just came out today and it takes effect immediately. It's not a super huge deal and it's somewhat helpful for a change. Yeah. So uh, the, the main issue is, you know, when you're filing your I-485 for adjustment of status, you normally would submit a medical exam done by a civil surgeon. Um, now they're making a requirement that that medical exam has, can't be issued more than 60 days before you file your application. So once the medical exam is signed by that civil surgeon, you have to file your 485 within 60 days or the medical's no good. So that's kind of the downside. So you really can't go early to get your medical exam done unless mm -hmm. you're sure you're going to file it within the next 60 days. Yeah. The good thing, however, is that they're expanding the validity period of that medical to two years. Yeah. So Initially, uh, several years ago, once you filed your 485 with a valid medical, that medical stayed valid the whole time your case was pending. You never had to go back and do it again. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, they changed that and said, nope, medicals are only good for one year, which meant that people, because processing times are so long yeah. or dates retrogress and now you're, you're in the backlog again, even though you filed your 485, you end up getting a medical exam every year, yeah. um, or it delays finally when the visa becomes available. They can't mm -hmm. approve it because you've got to go out and get another medical, wait for the RFE and all of that hassle. Yeah. So now they've expanded it to two years. So hopefully, once you file your 485, processing times will stay less than two years so that you never have to get the medical done again. Yeah, that would be a huge help. Um, I've had a couple of I-485 interviews in the past couple of months where an RFE was sent for a new medical exam literally days before the interview, um, like six days before the interview, an RFE arrives in the mail asking for a new medical exam. And so, of course, if you've ever gone to get the exam, you know that it takes a couple of weeks at least for the vaccinations to get processed, um, all of that to be done. So that would be great if the exams are valid for two years. It will save the applicants a lot of money. These exams aren't cheap. Um, so hopefully you will only need to get one from now on. All right, um, just a quick update on H4 EAD. There are no updates, basically. Yeah. Uh, we still expect a proposed regulation by the end of the year. Uh, nothing has been put in the OMB for review as of today. So it's a slow process. It is expected to happen, and it seems like the proposal will happen towards the end of the year. Again, just because it's proposed, it doesn't change anything. It's just a proposal. While the whole regulatory process is going on, you can continue to file. USCIS will continue to approve them. They'll give you the renewals. What we don't know is, assuming the plan is to completely rescind the H-4 EAD rule, what will happen to those with valid EADs and what will happen to those that are pending at the time of that final rule mm -hmm. taking effect. Um, and there is no way to know that. Um, they will actually normally put a transition period and explain what they plan to do in the proposed rule. So once we have a proposed rule, we'll have a better idea of what their plan is on that. I think it's likely that those that have valid EADs will at least be able to continue till they expire. Mm -hmm. um, those that are pending probably will be adjudicated um, since they were filed before the rule took effect. Again, this is speculation mainly based on how they uh, handled the DACA right. uh, rescission. So, you know, keep filing. There's no issues right now. Just know that at some point we will see a proposal and then a final rule and then probably a lawsuit at that yeah. point. 
Uh, we have a couple of questions about premium processing for, I'm assuming, H-1B applications. So the premium processing suspension is still in place uh, right now until February 2019. It does not affect extension applications. Someone asked about filing an extension at Vermont. Actually, uh, extension only applications, if you're requesting a continuation of previously approved employment without change, an extension of status, those are all filed at the Nebraska Service Center, regardless of where your H-1B petitioner's uh, main office is located in the U.S. So uh, actually, those are the only H-1B applications right now that can still be filed in premium processing with the exception of some cap exempt organizations, H-1B processing. So uh, if your extension is being prepared and it qualifies as a continuation without change, you can file it at Nebraska and you can file it in premium for now. Uh, someone else also asked um, about their premium extension that is pending at the Nebraska Service Center, but it's been pending for 20 days. Um, so yeah, so that was one of the caveats, I think, that USCIS included in their announcement when they said that um, applications can still be filed in premium processing. They actually made the caveat mostly related to applications filed at Vermont or California prior to September 11th, I believe, um, but they did mention that they would try to premium process all the applications that they received the timely request for, but that if they could not process them within 15 days, they would refund the $1,225 check. Um, so we haven't heard of that happening at Nebraska so far, but it's possible. Um, we did expect that Nebraska would probably also be flooded with premium processing requests once the suspension went into effect, so that may be what's happening. In the meantime, I would say if the premium processing check was cashed, you can you or your attorney can contact the premium processing unit by sending an email and following up if it is past six, uh, 15 days. All right, one question we have from Himanshu regarding H4 EAD validity. Um, you know, what end date does USCIS give on the H4 EAD validity when you file that application? So it's typically going to be in line with the I-94 end date. So uh, in the question, it's mentioned that the I-797 has one validity, the visa stamp has another validity. Mm -hmm. Which one is going to be given on the EAD? And it's really not based on either. It's based on the most recent I-94 issued. So it sounds like perhaps there was some travel involved. And when mm -hmm. at the time of entry, maybe the I-94 was given to, to the end date on the visa stamp. That means the EAD is likely going to be issued to the same date. So they look at whatever the current validity is on the I-94 for either the H-4 or the H-1, depending on whether you're filing them all together or separate, that's typically what the EAD validity will be. Uh, we have a question uh, from Krishna about qualifications uh, for, I assume, an IT position where the degrees, his degrees, his background is in biotech and biomedical engineering. Um, so yeah, this is a pretty um, pretty common issue we're seeing in RFEs this year on the relationship between H-1B beneficiaries' field of study in their degree and the position that they're being sponsored for for the H-1B, particularly when uh, the beneficiary's background is in engineering and the position they're being sponsored for is in IT. Uh, so we have definitely seen a lot of RFEs asking about that. The chances of success does seem to depend on the particular area of engineering that the degree is in. What we've seen is that if the degree is in something like electronics or electrical engineering, uh, communications engineering, um, there's usually a much better chance of approval. You'll still get an RFE probably. You may need to get uh, an experience evaluation and uh, make the argument on the connection between electrical engineering and computer science. Uh, but for the most part, I think we've seen those RFEs, RFE responses be successful. When it is a more unrelated field like biomedical engineering or biotech um, or even mechanical engineering, um, we've seen aerospace engineering, um, chemical engineering, those are going to be more difficult. Uh, we've seen officers uh, be much more 
difficult in approving those applications. You will still need um, an evaluation that takes into account your experience. You need at least three years of IT experience in order to submit um, even to an evaluator to evaluate your experience in education. Um, that used to be all you needed really in evaluation from a professor at a university who says that they've evaluated your experience and that um, combined with your education, it is the equivalent of a bachelor's in computer science or a similar field. That evaluation doesn't even seem to be enough anymore if it is a more unrelated field like chemical engineering or biomedical engineering. Um, we've seen USCIS even question recently the professor's authority to grant college level credit for experience, even though there was a letter from a registrar, a letter from the dean. Um, so this is becoming increasingly um, difficult. I would definitely discuss uh, with an attorney and evaluate all your experience and see um, how you can get the strongest evaluation to support your H-1B. You may need to get additional documents from your evaluator um, beyond what they normally provide. Yeah, beneficiary qualifications I think is kind of the, the newest target I would yeah. say for ways USCIS can come up with to deny mm -hmm. petitions. So definitely um, you know, there is no prior uh, deference to prior adjudications. So just because you've been approved in the past uh, does not mean this time around you will be. So definitely if your degree is not super closely related to the position, um, make sure that is thoroughly discussed before filing your next petition. Um, Addy has a question about his wife's H-4 EAD. You know, it's expiring in November 2019 with the long processing times for extending the H-4 plus EAD you know, if it's still not approved by November 2019, can she keep working because she filed the extension? And unfortunately, the answer is no. So for H-4 EADs specifically, there is no work authorization based on a pending renewal of the EAD. Once the card expires, if the new card is not in your hand, you have to stop working until the new card comes in. Um, Bala has a question about recent RFEs on STEM OPT cases. So I assume, I'm not sure if this means the I-765 application for the STEM OPT extension or on an H-1B petition with the change of status from F-1 to H-1. We do see on the H-1B petitions where a change of status has been requested, um, we do see a few RFEs here and there asking about um, was the STEM OPT extension time, did you properly maintain your status during that time? They're specifically asking about unemployment time. You have to make sure that you didn't cross the limits of 120 days of unemployment during the STEM OPT. Um, so they are checking into that. We haven't really seen a lot of issues with the STEM OPTs working at third party sites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we did initially, and then we had some success in responding to those. USCIS updated their website after the initial update, mm -hmm. changing it back to what it was. So that doesn't seem to be an issue. I'm not really aware of 765 applications running into trouble for STEM OPT yeah. extensions. Um, Ravi asks, can we change the wage level to a higher wage level on the next renewal? Yeah, definitely. Um, every time you file a new H-1B application, um, it's an opportunity to make any changes to the employment terms. Uh, so if your salary has increased since your previous H-1B application, um, you're, and it's at the new wage level, um, your employer can definitely file your extension with a level two or three. Uh, Vinay has a question about switching from H-4 EAD to back to H-1B. So this is someone who had an H-1B before, switched to H-4 EAD, now has an approved I-140 and is going to switch back to H-1 to get the extension and recapture any time that was re um, previously unused as well as be eligible for an extension beyond the six-year limit. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can do that. However, um, you can't work based on the H-1 receipt in that situation. When it's a change of status, so once you file the change of status, if the 
um, EAD expires while the H-1B change of status is still in process, you have to stop working and you can't start again until the change of status to H-1B is actually approved. Uh, Raj, you had a question um, asking for an update on the on whether we've seen any rejections after this September 11th RFE memo has gone into effect. Um, I don't think we have, um, but part of that is also the, R the implementation of the RFE uh, notice of intent to deny memo on September 11th coincided with the premium processing suspension on September 11th. So a lot of applications that have been filed in the past month um, have been filed in regular processing just because premium is not available. So they are likely going to be pending for several months. Um, on the applications we have seen uh, movement on um, extensions filed in premium processing, I have not noticed anything unusual. I definitely haven't seen or heard yet of any denials without an RFE. Uh, Praveen has a question about change of status from F1 to H1 when someone has used day one CPT. Um, are we aware of change of status getting denied in those cases? We are. I believe um, a lot of those applications are still pending, but uh, I think we've heard of at least a handful of denials of the I-94 in those cases. The H-1B application may have been still approved, in which case the beneficiary would have to go for consular processing, but it does seem uh, pretty clear that USCIS considers day one CBT a failure to maintain proper F-1 status and is uh, denying the change of status accordingly. Yeah, and that becomes uh, a much bigger deal now after the August 9th unlawful presence memo. Uh, so if there is a failure to maintain status, uh, you know, that, that unlawful presence kicks in from August 9th or from the day the um, violation of status began, whichever is later. So it, it is retroactive and you've got to be really careful about the three-year bar to make sure that you've not crossed 180 days of unlawful presence, which for some people, if you don't get the result until March, you know, and you end up with a change of status denied due to an F-1 status violation, you've already crossed 180 days of unlawful presence. All right, uh, Himanshu has a question about uh, the I-485 application. Uh, and the ability of a spouse to work. So if you are the main applicant and your spouse is filing along with you as a derivative of your 485, you both file 485 applications and you're both eligible to file I-765 applications for work permits. So yes, once the um, EAD is approved, the spouse can work in that situation. Those are taking about 90 days to be processed for the EAD card. Mm -hmm. Uh, Anand has a question, and I actually um, have been doing a lot of consultations on this exact issue uh, the last few days here, and that is what, without premium processing, you know, if I'm filing a transfer mm -hmm. and I join the new company based on the receipt, which is completely acceptable under AC21, what happens if four months, five months later my transfer gets denied? Yeah. What are my options? Um, and that is a tough situation. The denial puts you out of status immediately from the day the decision takes effect. Um, I think that your options kind of depend on the specific situation. You know, if the I-94 uh, has not expired and your previous petition is still valid, hasn't been withdrawn, you may be able to go back to your old employer and continue working to maintain your status, so that's one option but um, filing a transfer to another employer at that point, it's likely needs to be done through consular processing, filing, refiling the transfer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe depending on the situation, you could make a sort of nunk pro tunk argument, but it's likely that anything you file after that point is going to be approved without an I-94 because the denial 
puts you out of status on that date. There's no unlawful presence if your I-94 is still valid, but out of status is still going to be a problem. Uh, someone asked a question about filing an extension uh, when there's been a change in their occupation such that their SOC code has changed on their LCA. So when can something be filed as a continuation of previously approved employment with the Nebraska Service Center, which is eligible for premium processing? And when is something considered a material change such that it needs to be filed with Vermont or California? Um, those, yeah, those are issues that you will need to discuss pretty closely with your immigration attorney. Um, it's really case by case. I would say if it is still pretty closely related, um, I don't want to give actual SOC codes as examples, but um, it does need to be evaluated case by case, I would say. Um, evaluating how different your current SOC code is from a previous one. If they are within the same area, I would say it's in your job duties uh, don't include that many more managerial responsibilities or supervisory responsibilities. Um, if there hasn't been too significant a change in your salary, uh, then the factors may be lined up enough for you to file as a continuation of previously approved employment with Nebraska. All right, Sai has a question about unpaid leave for someone who's on an H-1B visa. Um, you know, is there a set requirement on how much unpaid leave you can use? Uh, no, the idea of being here on an H-1B is that you're here to work. Um, so taking an unpaid leave could be considered uh, not maintaining status. So you have to be really careful about that and make sure that you speak with an attorney before you do that. Now, um, if, it, and it also depends on the employer's vacation policy and their paid leave policy. Maybe they don't have a paid vacation time policy, but they allow you to take a one week unpaid leave to go on vacation. That's probably fine, you're allowed to go on vacation. Yeah. Now, are you allowed to take a three month unpaid leave um, Maybe not. That that might be considered out of status for H one B, and I think it really depends on the reason. You know, if yeah. it's three months because of maternity leave, right. That's a different story. Is it three months because your employer no longer has a project for you? That's yeah. a completely different story, and that can be a huge violation for both the employer and the employee. So before taking any kind of unpaid leave, uh, definitely discuss that with a, an attorney regarding the specific situation, and be careful with that. Yeah, generally we would say that if the leave is being in requested or initiated by the beneficiary um, for a reason like maternity or family leave, um, so far we've seen no problems really with USCIS considering that it's still maintaining status as long as there's documentation of it. So don't wait until you've been on leave for three months to try to w produce documentation for it. Make sure everything is there before you go on leave. Um, emails or a leave request form or something that you've submitted to your employer. All right, Aditi has a good question about changing jobs uh, when you're on H-1B and you have an approved PERM labor certification and an approved I-140, but you haven't yet filed the 485 because your priority date is not current. Um, are there any restrictions on the new job? Does it have to be 50% the same? Um, you know, there, there is a requirement in some situations where the new job has to be same or similar to the old job. That is only in the case where you've already filed your 485 mm -hmm. and you're using AC21 to take your pending green card process with you to the new employer. In that situation, the new job does have to be same or similar to the original job that you were sponsored for. If you have not filed the 485 and you're looking to change jobs, there's no restrictions on that. You can work in any job that you're qualified for and that qualifies for the type of visa that you're applying for. Now, whether a new labor certification and I-140 is needed really depends on the situation. Um, if you are um, you know, 
moving into a new job temporarily, but the original job that you were sponsored for on the labor certification in I-140 remains available and your plan is to go back to that job, uh, then that labor in I-140 remains valid for you and you, can, you don't have to file anything else. If you're moving to a new job and the, that original job that you were sponsored for is no longer there or it's a completely different job, then that labor certification is no longer valid for the new job and, you, uh, and a new labor certification would be required. So it really depends on exactly what the situation is. Is it the same employer, new employer? Is it at, before the 485, after the 485? Lots of factors go into that. But in some, some situations, yes, a new labor certification is going to be needed. In some situations, it won't be needed. Siva says that um, I upgraded my I-140 from EB-3 to EB-2 a few years back, and now your EB-3 is current. Um, can he use the EB-3? So, yeah, so this month um, in October, um, it's a rare occurrence where EB-3 for Indian-born nationals um, is farther ahead than EB-2. So in some cases, if your um, priority date is current under, under EB-3 and you only have an EB-2 I-140 approval, uh, you can file an I-140 in EB-3, basically a downgrade, whereas usually we are upgrading from EB-3 to EB-2. In this case, it would be a downgrade from EB-2 to EB-3. The advantage is that you can use the same PERM labor certification to support this second I-140. So you don't need to go through the whole PERM process again. Uh, you would just prepare the I-140 petition based on the existing labor certification. Um, and if your priority date is current in October, we would recommend filing it concurrently with the I-485 while you still can. Um, but definitely start on that soon since the month is already half over. It needs to be submitted to USCIS by October 31st. All right, Raja has a question about um, you know a transfer denial, and you know can I file another transfer to a different company after I've received a denial of a transfer and I've already joined that company where the, the transfer was denied. So he was working for company A, has a valid I-94, valid I-797 approval notice for a couple of years transfers to company B and starts working for B while it's pending and now that transfer has been denied, can he now transfer to company C and can he start working for company C as soon as that transfer is filed? Um, so the denial of company B's transfer puts you out of status. So when you file a transfer and you join the new company, you're technically in what's called a period of authorized stay based on the pending transfer. You're technically not in H-1B status. You're not out of status. You're not accruing unlawful presence, but you're in a period of authorized stay, which allows you to work and stay in the country for company B. Once that gets denied, you're out of status. You're not unlawfully present because there's been no I-94 expiration. You didn't overstay an I-94, but once you're out of status, to file anything else, you always have to prove on the date of filing that you're in status and properly maintaining that status. So you won't be able to do that because the bridge that gets you from company A to company C has collapsed because of the denial of company B. So can you file a transfer to company C? Yes, company C can file a petition for you. Can you join them based on that? Um, I think that it really depends on specific situation. If there's some sort of nunk pro tunk argument you could make, maybe there was an extraordinary circumstance surrounding it that allows USCIS to use their discretion to overlook the gap in your status, maybe, but most likely um, transfer to company C is going to get the petition approved, but the I-94 will be denied for failure to maintain status at the time of filing. You'll have to go outside the country, get the visa stamp, and come back in order to regain your status. Um, so one other way to do that is to have company to leave the country, com company, leave the country and the company um, at the time of the denial have the new company file a petition requesting consular processing and you wait outside the U.S. for that to be processed, get the visa stamp, then come back in. That way you've not spent any time out of status, you've not accrued any unlawful presence, 
that's kind of the cleaner way to do it, mm -hmm. but without premium processing, that's really tough right now. It's a long wait to get that approval. Yeah. Uh, Himanshu asks, if you get promoted in uh, with your existing employer, do they need to redo the H-1B? So it really, again, depends on the specific circumstances. So the rule is that if there is a material change in the terms of H-1B employment, uh, an amendment application needs to be filed with USCIS. There isn't any clear rules necessarily on what constitutes a material change. Um, so it is sort of a, um, a field test, but I would definitely discuss it with your immigration attorney. They would look at your existing H-1B application, uh, find out how different your new job duties are, uh, whether it comes with an increase in salary. Um, a general rule I sometimes use is that if your salary is increasing to the point that it would go up a wage level on the LCA, that is probably an indication that you may need to amend the H-1B application. Um, so definitely discuss with your attorney. In general, prior to implementing any change in H-1B employment, it's a good idea to check with your immigration attorney first um, before implementing the change to find out if it's material and amendment needs to be filed. We get a lot of after the fact questions or consultations. Um, you know, this happened six months ago and now I'm going for visa stamping. Is it okay? Well, at that point, if an amendment is needed, not really, because an, an amendment is needed and you may need to delay your trip until the amendment is approved before you can go for visa stamping. Um, so definitely check with your attorney before any changes in employment take place. All right, Aditi has a follow-up question on changing employers with an approved I-140. At what stage are you able to retain the priority date on that I-140 when you file with your new employer? So under the January 17th, 2017 regulation, they extended the I-140 validity and basically as long as your I-140 has been approved for 180 days, when you move to a different employer, even if the company withdraws your approved I-140, you can still retain that priority date. You have to file a new labor, new I-140 with the new employer, but you can retain that priority date at the time of filing your I-140. If it's been less than 180 days since your I-140 was approved and the company withdraws it, you cannot retain that priority date in that situation. So it's important to ensure that the I-140 remains valid for at least 180 days um, before taking any action. Uh, Lynn had a quick question on how much it would cost a startup to sponsor her H-1B application. Um, there are 10 employees. so. Uh, assuming it's um, a brand new company that you've um, has never filed an H-1B for you before, the filing fees right now are two thousand six hundred forty or fifty, um, basically about twenty six hundred dollars um, for companies that have twenty six or more employees. If it is twenty five or fewer, the filing fees are one thousand seven hundred ten. Uh, with premium processing, if and when that becomes available again next February, um, premium processing is an additional fourteen hundred. So, you're looking at between three and four thousand dollars, probably, to just for the filing fees. Um, attorneys' fees, if the company uses an attorney, would also need to be paid by the sponsoring company. Um, so, those will be based on the attorney's office. Let's see. Um, uh, just to wrap up here, uh, you know, some of the the news over the last week or two has been on that public charge proposed regulation. Yeah. Do you have kind of an overview of how that would impact high skilled immigrants? Yeah. So um, the news of a proposed rule has been out for a few weeks, but I think DHS actually published it last. Wednesday, October 10th, they published um, their proposed rule on the public charge issue. It will affect uh, almost all immigration applications, I feel like. Um, even uh, non-immigrant applications for changes or extensions of status that are filed with USCIS right now. Um, the main crux of this public charge rule is um, 
the rule that aliens are not admissible to the U.S. if there is a possibility that they will become a public charge um, in the U.S., basically using um, government benefits. Uh, this is mostly uh, applied at the time that you're applying for adjustment of status or applying for admission into the U.S. It used to not really affect at all uh, changes, uh, change of status or extension of status applications, I-129 and I-539 forms, but uh, the public charge rule seems like it will um, affect those applications as well. So Yeah, I think that kind of what they're proposing is some sort of attestation on the, the application confirming that you have not used public benefits and don't intend to, and then depending on you know, what information USCIS has, they can always come back and send a request for evidence for this new form that asks for a lot more financial information from the employee. Um, so we, you know, it has to go through the regulatory process, so this is just a proposal right now. There's a lot of um, people, I think, against it, so probably going to end up in lawsuits yet again, um, but just stay tuned for that. Um, other than that, I think that is it for today. If we didn't get to your question or you want more information, you can always join one of our daily conference calls. Those are free and you can get the schedule and dial in information for that on our website at rnlawgroup.com. Or if you want to set up a consultation with Rebecca or myself or any of our attorneys to discuss your specific situation, you can go to rnlawgroup.com and make an appointment there as well. You can always uh, get the latest updates by going to immigrationgirl.com, following us on Twitter at rnlawgroup or at immigrationgirl. And thank you for joining us today, and we will be back on Tuesday with more updates.